Hey, BookTube, welcome back to the History Shelf. Uh, today is Friday, and today we have a ton of new arrivals that have uh, kind of piled up over the last couple weeks. Um, I wish I had gotten to some of these sooner, so I apologize uh, on the delay. But um, these are books that have either recently come out or are on the horizon, so keep an eye out for those. Um, let's start with the three finalists, though, of the Kundal History Prize, the um, the esteemed and prestigious History Prize um, that recently announced. They had the the winner was announced yesterday, and uh, I was lucky enough. I was contacted to see if I would like to um, take a look at the three. Uh, finalists and I was so tickled and I shared that on my Instagram account the history shelf which if you want to follow um, is down in the description box along with my other um, social media uh, but let's take a look at what who the three finalists were and I'll let you know who the winner was which was just announced yesterday but Marie Favreau's The Horde How the Mongols Changed the World uh, put out by Harvard Belknap, Belknap Harvard Press um I'm not surprised that this this one made it into the uh, into the final, and it, it's just such a, a rich topic. It's uh, it just goes so deep here. Let me just read you a, a, a quick um, description. Let's see. Okay, it says the Mongols are widely known for one thing: conquest. In the first comprehensive history of the Horde. The western portion of the Mongol Empire that arose after the death of Genghis Khan, Marie Favreau, shows that the accomplishments of the Mongols extended far beyond war. For 300 years, the Horde was no less a force in global development than Rome had been. Uh, it left behind a profound legacy in Europe, Russia, Central Asia, and the Middle East, palpable to this day. Uh, I'm going to go skip down here. It says, The Horde is the eloquent, ambitious, and definitive portrait of an empire little understood and too readily dismissed. Challenging conceptions of nomads as peripheral to history, Favreau makes clear that we live in a world inherited from the Mongol moment. And there's our author, Marie Favreau. So she was um, shortlisted and became one of the three finalists. All right. So the next um, finalist for the, uh, the Kundal, 2021 Kundal History Prize is Rebecca Clifford's Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust. This is put up by Yale University Press. I'll give you a little description here. Um, how can we make sense of our lives when we do not know where we come from? This was a pressing question for the youngest survivors of the Holocaust, whose pre-war memories were vague or non-existent. In this tremendously absorbing and insightful study, Rebecca Clifford follows the lives of child survivors out of the ruins of conflict through their adulthood and into old age. Drawing on archives and interviews, Clifford charts the experiences of these children and those who cared for them, as well as those who studied them, such as Anna Freud. Survivors explores the aftermath of the Holocaust in the long term and reveals how these children, often branded the lucky ones, had to struggle to be able to call themselves survivors at all. Challenging our assumptions about trauma and memory, Clifford's powerful and, and surprising narrative helps us understand what it was like to live with childhoods marked by such rupture and loss. I uh, don't have a picture of the author in the back, but it um, sounds fascinating. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to these, hopefully over the Christmas break. And the final finalist for the 2021 Kundal History Prize um, is Blood on the River. Um, the Untold Story of the Berbice Slave Re Rebellion, A Chronicle of Mutiny and Freedom on the Wild Coast by Marjolene Kars. And this one is put out by the New Press. Okay. Um, and here is our author. So let's let's read about I've never I've never heard of the Burbese Rebellion, so let's let's get into this. On Sunday, February twenty seventh, seventeen sixty three, thousands of slaves in the Dutch colony of Burbese in present day Guyana uh, launched a massive rebellion that came amazingly close to succeeding. Surrounded by jungle and savanna, the revolutionaries, many of them African born, and Europeans struck and parried for an entire year. In the end, the Dutch prevailed because of one unique advantage, their ability to get soldiers and supplies from neighboring colonies and from Europe. Blood on the River is the explosive story of this little-known revolution, one that almost changed the face of the Americas. 
Drawing on 900 interrogation transcripts collected by the Dutch when the Burmese Rebellion finally collapsed, and which were subsequently buried in Dutch archives, wow, historian Marjolaine Kars reconstructs an extraordinarily rich day-by-day account of this pivotal event. Blood on the River provides a rare in-depth look at the political vision of enslaved people at the dawn of the Age of Revolution and introduces us to a set of real characters vividly drawn against the exotic tableau of a riverine world of plantations, rainforest, and Carib allies who controlled a vast South American hinterland. An astonishing and original work of history, Blood on the River will change our understanding of revolution, slavery, and the story of freedom in the New World. It does sound fascinating, and it sounds like she just she got access to a <clears throat> treasure trove of uh, primary source material that wasn't um, available before to tell the story. So this is the final um, finalist for the, the prize. So we have three these three books, and I just saw on... Uh, the Instagram feed yesterday, they announced the winner. I wasn't able to attend. I usually attend these events like virtually uh, live when they announce the winner, um, but I was not able to view it in real time, but we found out the winner. So the winner of the 2021 Kundal History Prize is, drum roll please, it's Blood on the River, um, a chronicle of mutiny and freedom on the Wild Coast. The Untold, the Untold Story of the Burby Slave Rebellion by Marjolaine Carr. So congratulations to Marjolaine Carrs and the New Press. Um, I'm looking forward to reading this winner. I have the winner from last year as well, Fifth, Fifth Son by Camilla Townsend. And it was a history, a new history on the Aztecs. So that was fascinating. Okay. What else has come across my desk? Um... We've seen this before, long ago on my channel. I had an advanced review copy sent to me, but I was able to get the final copy, which is great because this one has all the pictures, um, all the, you know, the final, you know, bibliography, index, and all that kind of great stuff. But uh, very happy to get this chunkster. Uh, Robert Lyman's A War of Empires, Japan, India, Burma, and Britain, 1941 to 45, um, by Osprey. And uh, wonderful folks at Bloomsbury who were, uh, I've been in contact with them. They, they, were able, they were able to send me this final copy. Um, I was happy to have both an advanced review copy and um, the final copy. Um, you know, I've been having an issue where I'm not sure what to do with my advanced reader copies once I'm done with them or if I have duplicates. So if there's anyone out there and if you're interested in, I'm going to hang on to the finished copy because I, you know, I kind of need it for my research and for uh, just trying to make sure that I've got everything I need as far as the photos and stuff go. But, but if you're interested, uh, I have a, hang on, let me grab it. Where is it? Okay, I don't know where I did with it, but I <laughs> let me see if I can find it. I was going to donate it, but I can't really donate it to, well, tell you what. If there's anyone interested in the, the, the arc of this, I can send it out to you. So let me know in the comments below, and we can DM with addresses and stuff. But um, this is the War of Empires. Let me just give you a quick rundown here in case you guys don't remember what this was, was about. It's pretty self-explanatory, but it says here, By 1942, the British and Indian armies had been brutally defeated, and Japan reigned supreme in its newly conquered territories throughout Asia. But change was coming. New commanders were appointed, significant training and restructuring took place, and new tactics were developed. In A War of Empires, Robert Lyman expertly recounts these coordinated efforts and describes how a new volunteer Indian army, rising from the ashes of defeat, would ferociously fight to turn the tide of war. Victory, however, did not come immediately. It wasn't until March 1944, when the Japanese staged their famed March on Delhi, that the years of rebuilding yielded results, and after bitter fighting, the Japanese were finally defeated at Kohima and Impal. Uh, a, war of Empire, a War of Empires deals details both these hard-fought battles and the subsequent extraordinary victories 
that culminated in the collapse of all Japanese forces in Burma, highlighting the Indian Army's contribution to these victories, which has been consistently forgotten and ignored by many Western historians. Robert Lyman proves how vital this campaign was in securing Allied success in the East, defeating Japanese militarism, and ultimately re redrawing the map of the region with an independent India, free from the shackles of empire, all but guaranteed. Um, so the, this is going to be fantastic. Um, I'm glad to have the final copy. Uh, let's see, there's a lot going on here in this book. It's well, it's about 500 pages. And we've got pictures on the inside, so that's great. But if you're interested in uh, a free advanced review copy of this, let me know, and I'll see. Yeah, I see it. I have it. So, okay. Let me know. All right. Now, I've always been a big fan of this gentleman's work, his work on ancient history. Not so much his most recent book on uh, a certain ex-president. Um, but I still think he has a lot to offer as far as insights into... Um, America, um, our political foundations, stuff like that. So I'm willing to give this one a try. We're going to see. I, I really hope that um, it's balanced and not too, too partisan, but I don't know, the subtitle. We'll see. But anyway, this is from Basic Books, and this is Victor Davis Hanson's new book, The Dying Citizen, How Progressive Elites, Tribalism, and Globalization Are Destroying the Idea of America. So probably going to be a little bit <laughs> one-sided but we'll see uh i still keep hoping he's going to come back to me man come back to us victor um it says here and this is a brand new release so this says here human history is full of the stories of peasants subjects and tribes yet the concept of the citizen is historically rare and was until recently amongst america's most profoundly cherished ideals but without shock treatment, warns historian Victor Davis Hansen, American citizenship as we have known it may soon vanish. In The Dying Citizen, Hansen outlines the forces that led to this crisis. Over the last half century, numerous forces from both above and below have conspired to undermine the value we place in the idea of citizenship and our vigilance in protecting it. To be self-governing, citizens must be economically autonomous, but the evisceration of the middle class and the rise of inequality have made many Americans dependent on the federal government. Citizenship exists within delineated borders, but open borders and the elite concept of, quote, global citizenship, end quote, have rendered meaningless the idea of allegiance to a particular place. Citizenship relies on the renunciation of tribal identity in favor of the state, but identity politics have eradicated the idea of a collective civic sense of self. A vastly expanded unelected bureaucracy has overwhelmed the power of elected officials, thereby destroying the sovereign power of the citizen. Progressive academics and activists lay siege to the institutions and traditions of constitutional citizenship. As in the revolutionary years of 1848, 1917, and 1968, 2020 ripped away our complacency about the future. But in the aftermath, we as Americans can rebuild and recover what we have lost. The choice is ours. All right. Well, I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to see what happens here with this one. I'll let you know. Okay. Um, let's go to, I'm very excited. We'll go to Civil War history right now. Um, this is from the University of, no, sorry, Indiana University Press. Very excited for this new biography. It's a big one. It's John, General John A. Rollins, No Ordinary Man, by Alan J. Ottens. Um, nice blurb from Harold Holzer on the front. Boy, you can't go wrong with that. Now, Civil War fans, tell me. You know who this is, right, without me telling you? Well, he was essential to, um, he worked very closely. He was on the staff with Grant, U.S. Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, um, and was a very big influence on him, especially around the areas of, um, you know, he was a teetotaler, John Rollins was, and a lot of people credit him with, you know, during some of the um, the slower days in Mississippi um, during the Vicksburg campaign with him trying to keep, you know, Grant from sliding back into some, some habits. But let's see. Let's take a look at what this, this uh, 
this description says here, no one succeeds alone, and Ulysses S. Grant was no exception. From the earliest days of the Civil War to the height of Grant's power in the White House, John A. Rollins was ever at Grant's side. Yet Rollins' role in Grant's career is often overlooked. So this book, no, General John A. Rollins, No Ordinary Man, by Alan J. Ottens, is the first major biography of Rollins in over a century and traces his rise to assistant adjutant general and ultimately Ulysses S. Grant's Secretary of War. I forgot that he was Secretary of War, actually. Wow. Um, very cool. So, I mean, <clears throat> that's the description. Um, but it's got... I mean, the blurbs on the back, I mean, that's bank right here. He's got James McPherson and Peter Cousins recommending this biography. Um, so I am very excited to get to that. Look at this beautiful spine as well. So General John A. Rollins, No <clears throat> Ordinary Man, out now from Indiana University Press. You can find it on Amazon, too. But I'm excited to have that. Um, let's stick with some type of civil war. This is a... Very interesting book that came out. I was contacted by the um, publicist at the University of North Carolina Press. They asked if I might be interested in taking a look at this, and I said, heck yeah. And this is Gettysburg, 1963, um, Civil Rights, Cold War Politics, and Historical Memory in America's Most Famous Small Town by Jill Oglin T Ogline Titus. Uh, slim little volume, but it sounds really intriguing. Uh, so let's take a look here. The year 1963 was unforgettable for Americans. In the midst of intense Cold War turmoil and the escalating struggle for black freedom, the United States also engaged in a nationwide commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Civil War. Commemorative events centered on Gettysburg, site of the best-known, bloodiest, and most symbolically charged battle of the conflict. Inevitably, the centennial of Lincoln's iconic Gettysburg Address received special focus pressed into service to help the nation understand its present and define its future. A future that would ironically include another tragic event days later with the assassination of another American president. In this fascinating work, Jill Ogline Titus uses centennial events in Gettysburg to examine the history of political, social, and community change in 1960s America. Examining the experiences of political leaders, civil rights activists, preservation-minded Civil War enthusiasts, and local residents, Titus shows how the era's deep divisions thrust Gettysburg into the national spotlight and ensured that white and black Americans would define the meaning of the battle, the address, and the war in dramatically different ways. And this is part of their Civil War landmark series, uh, a series of studies. Um, very, very outstanding. I don't know. I'm, I'm reading the back as I'm talking. Sorry. Uh, so it looks like Jill Titus is associate director of the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. So doesn't that look interesting? Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Um, I will report back any type of insights that uh, jump out at me in this work. So thank you, University of North Carolina Press. That is, that is out now if anyone is interested. Another University of North Carolina Press book that is out now, and I think I've already seen on another channel, I received this a while ago, and I'm so sorry for not getting to this sooner, um, but this is to address you as my friend, um, uh, African Americans' Letters to Abraham Lincoln, edited by Jonathan W. White, and forward by Edna Green Medford. Now, Jonathan W. White, I believe, is the one of the first books I reviewed on my channel, I think. I think that was him. It's called Midnight in America. It's about dreams in the Civil War and how dreams kind of defined a lot of, or, you know, um, was another aspect of, like, Civil War history that people haven't really explored, like psychosocial history. Uh, anyway, I, I'm pretty sure that's the same Jonathan W. White. But, mm. Yes, it is. Yes, Jonathan W. White. He wrote Midnight in America, Darkness, Sleep, and Dreams during the Civil War. That was one of the first books I reviewed on my channel. So that is a marked distinction, sir. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, okay, so a great another Lincoln book. I've been reading a lot of Lincoln books recently, a lot of them for review. I've been reviewing them for other publications. Tons of I just, Lincoln books, they just never stop. They never stop coming. 
And uh, I'm glad to see that Bill Rutenberg at the Rutenberg Channel has this book. I think Steve sent this copy to him. Um, it says here, many African Americans of the Civil War era felt a personal connection to Abraham Lincoln. For the first time in their lives, an occupant of the White House seemed concerned about the welfare of their race. Indeed, despite the tremendous injustice and discrimination that they faced, African Americans now had confidence to write to the president and to seek redress of their grievances. Their letters expressed the dilemmas, doubts, and dreams of both recently enslaved and free people in the throes of dramatic change. For many, writing Lincoln was a last resort, yet their letters were often full of determination, making explicit claims to the rights of U.S. citizenship in a wide range of circumstances. This compelling collection presents more than 120 letters from African Americans to Lincoln, most of which have never before been published. They offer unflinching, intimate, and often heart-wrenching portraits of black soldiers and civilians' experiences in wartime. Um, as readers continue to think critically about Lincoln's image as the great emancipator, this book centers African Americans' own voices to explore how they felt about the president and how they understood the possibilities and limits of the power vested in the federal government. So uh, this is going to be great. I love reading letters just in general. I love books of just collections of letters. Um, you get pictures as well, obviously, of the people who wrote to Lincoln. We've got uh, other folks in here as well. Here we go. Wow, this is great. A lot of these pictures I've never seen before. So, Two great books uh, from University of North Carolina Press. So check those out. They are out now. Um, let's see here. Yes, Farrar, Strauss, and Drew, one of my favorite uh, publishers, um, contacted me and I, uh, if I was be interested in taking a look at this book, and I said, absolutely. This is um, coming out in March, March 1st, so I still have some time to get to this. Um, but this is What It Took to Win, A History of the Democratic Party by Michael Kazin. Um, obviously, this is the advanced review copy, but um, so... I'm sure this will be the cover of sorts, but you know, all this other stuff is kind of for marketing purposes. And um, This is a leading historian's definitive narrative of the world's oldest political organ organization and its commitment to moral capitalism. In quotes, moral capitalism, from Andrew Jackson to Joseph Biden. Um, I'll hold this one up while I read it. It says here, what it took to win tells the story of how the oldest mass party uh, in the world, contended for power, and what its leaders did with it when they won. It took a hideous, hideously long time for the self-proclaimed party of the people to welcome the support from citizens of all races, faiths, and genders, rather than only fighting for the needs of white males. For the first century of its existence, the Democratic Party was, in fact, if not official doctrine, an organization that solicited the votes of white men only, and neglected or disparaged everyone else. During the 19th century, their leaders carried out the forced removal of Native Americans from their ancestral lands, defended slavery and allowed it to expand, did their best to sabotage Reconstruction, and constructed the brutal Jim Crow order that followed. They also lagged behind Republicans in endorsing women's suffrage. Not until the 1930s did the party at the national level begin tentatively to embrace an interracial constituency. The change was a long time in coming, but it took three more decades before it was able to pass strong civil rights laws. The party's evolution from first advocating only for white Americans to advocating for every citizen is a fascinating trajectory which Kazin masterfully lays out. Throughout their history, Democrats have won national elections and have been competitive in most states when they articulate a broadly egalitarian economic vision and advocate for laws intended to fulfill it. That foundational principle, though it left many out for decades and now embraces the entire citizenry, is something the party must reinforce if it wants to survive, win elections, and truly legislate its vision. So uh, this, is the, this says here this, there's a lot of books out there that cover various aspects of the Democratic Party's history, but it's saying here that Kazin's book is the only comprehensive history of the party itself. Um, so it does take you up to present day, I guess that's what they're kind of getting at here. Um, let's see here. It's a little over 300 pages. Whew, type is tiny, 
but I can get to this uh, and probably start going, probably get into this in January, I think. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading this because I've always found it just such an interesting switch in American politics, you know, um, how Democratic and Republicans, you know, Democrats and Republicans have kind of basically switched places in, in, in many ways. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, a lot of people who aren't aware of history or don't read much history, you know, just think the Democratic Party was always just about everyone's rights and was, uh, you know, racially uh, inclusive, and, and that just wasn't the case. And in fact, you know, reading so much about the Civil War, I just came to loathe Democrats. I mean, they were just awful. Now, the party has changed, obviously. But, um, yeah, I don't have a lot of great feelings for the Democratic Party, and I don't have a lot of great feelings for the Republican Party either. <laughs> um, and is there a third party av available? Not really. I mean, there's, there's third parties, but I don't know. You know, was it Washington that warned against parties? And you see his point. You see his point. <laughs> anyway, What It Took to Win by Michael Kazin. Coming out March 1st in 2022. I'll take a look at this in the new year. Uh, okay, a book that's coming out in mid-January, and this, this is kind of interesting, this is different, and this is from Riverhead Books, um, I've gotten a lot of books from them recently, a few books from them that I'm interested in showing, well, that, that I am showing, but uh, that I want to read, one of, two of them are historical fiction, but I think I have shown some other Riverhead books so that are also fiction, of, um, I think I showed them in my last, well, not my last video, but one before them, but this is coming in January. This is Kingdom of Characters, the language revolution that made China modern um, by Jing Su. It's coming out January 18th. So let me go ahead and read a little bit about this for you. We think of China as a leader in technological innovation and one of the world's most powerful countries, but just a century ago, it was almost left behind as a nation. Uh, Jing Su, a Yale professor and world-renowned authority on East Asian languages and the history of the Chinese language and script, argues that China's greatest and most daunting challenge was a linguistic one. Offering an unexpected perspective on the major events of China's tumultuous 20th century, Su tells a human story about the unlikely rebels and innovators fighting for something they believe in, they believe in and changing the world through language. Uh, in the vein of great books in its category, including the library book by Susan Orlean and Oracle Bones by P Peter Hessler, Kingdom of Characters uh, is a beautifully written and moving story about power, culture, and national identity. Uh, let me just read a little bit more because it's interesting. Chinese is the oldest living language uh, spoken by the most people in the world. Its written form has remained largely unchanged since it was first standardized more than 2,200 years ago. It is fundamentally unique, distinct from any other writing system in the world, built from individual dots and lines that form clusters of patterns with distinct contour. Uh, witnessing a modern world increasingly transformed by various branches of Western science and new modes of electricity-powered communications, the Chinese language, along with the empire itself, struggled to be viable. The key to t China's technological advances and political maneuvers was a century-long fight to make the Chinese language accessible to the modern world of global trade and digital technology. Uh, behind every written character that can be learned and used today stands a group of human characters who went to extraordinary lengths to make sure that could happen. Uh, with no guidance other than their obsessive love for the Chinese language, their ambition opened up a world of discovery and revolution and bold, perilous adventure. This is fascinating. It says here, the revolution of the Chinese script is just as breathtaking as China's transformation into a capitalist juggernaut, in large part because those linguistic innovations enable China's re reinvention. In Kingdom of Characters, Su expertly weaves larger-than-life characters to craft a stunning narrative of modern China's development, revealing how language is the beating heart of technology, globalization, and power. So, uh, Keep this on your radar. I'm sure this is going to appeal to a lot of you out there, especially folks who are into languages or, you know, language studies. Um, I hope to learn a little bit. I've always been fascinated by um, just the Chinese script, and 
I, I can't even get my brain around it. I don't speak. I am only a one language speaker. So, you know, I've always been intrigued by um, just people who are able to read other languages or understand different languages, especially ones that have a different script that aren't, aren't based on any type of... Um, well, I mean, there's a Cyrillic alphabet, right? Which I tried to teach myself Russian once, but it's like, it's, it's more difficult when you have to learn new symbols, right? Um, with German, you still have the same, uh, same letters. They're just used in different variations and formations um, and accents and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to symbols and things like that, it's like, wow, it really blows me away. So check this one out. It's coming out in January. I'll be interested to get into that. Now, I, sh I shared this one a while ago on my Instagram account. This one is already out now, um, but I wanted to show it again because he's got such great books, and I love reading about geography and the history and how geography impacts history and impacts current events and things like this. But this is Tim Marshall's brand-new book, The Power of Geography, Ten Maps That Reveal the Future of Our World. So I don't have a finished copy yet, but I, I will try to get my hands on one. But this was a, an advanced copy that I received, and this was put out by Scribner. Uh, I have his other book. I think it was one of the – focus. <laughs> it was one of the first books I shared on one of my book hauls uh, when I started this channel over two years ago. I think it's, it's been over two years. It might even – gosh, I don't even know. It's been a while. Um, I had showed, uh, shown one of the books I picked up by him, his last book, which is Pris Prisoners. Um, Prisoners of Geography, 10 Maps That Explain Everything About the World. That's the one I, I, I shared um, when I first started my channel. But let's, let's read this. So, yeah, it says here, Tim Marshall's global bestseller, Prisoners of Geography, offered us a fresh way of looking at maps, showing how every nation's choices are limited by mountains, rivers, seas, and walls. Since then, the geography hasn't changed, but the world has. Now, in his revelatory new book, Marshall takes us into 10 regions set to shape global politics. Find out why U.S. interest in the Middle East will wane, why Australia is now beginning an epic contest with China, how Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and the U.K. are clever, cleverly positioning themselves for greater power, why Ethiopia can control Egypt, and why Europe's next refugee crisis looms closer than we think, as is a cutting-edge arms race to control space. Um, innovative, compelling, and delivered with Marshall's trademark wit and insight. This is a gripping and enlightening exploration of the power of geography to shape humanity's past, present, and most important, our future. So get your hands on this. Uh, get, a, get your hand on any of Tim Marshall's work because it's fascinating. Kind of reminds me of Robert Kaplan's earlier works that I've read, The Coming Anarchy. Um, you know, he's written extensively on how geography impacts um, geopolitics you know in fact i just uh, resubscribed to geopolitical futures which is a great like that you get like daily memos and analysis you get their their trend watch you get um uh what is this one called i has i got a brand new report um uh, the road to 2040 special report uh so i i love reading about just um uh, geopolitical, uh, you know, forces at work and, you know, what the prognosis or, you know, uh, what people are, you know, the, the, the pro prognosticators are saying about what to expect from different countries in the coming years, whether they're right or wrong, you know, it's kind of, it's still fascinating. So, um, but The Power of Geography by Tim Marshall, that is out now. All right, and then I have... I have to say, we're at 33 minutes. I'm going to try to keep this relatively brief. Uh, this book is out now, but these are two books from Melville House Publishing. I was really happy to get as part of their advanced readers program. This is Karachi Vice, Life and Death in a Divided City by Samira Shackle. So it's a Melville House Publishing book. Okay, this says here, Karachi. Pakistan's lar largest city is a sprawling metropolis of 20 million people, twice the size of New York City. It is a place of political turbulence in which those who have power wield it with brutal force. It takes an insider to know where is safe, who to trust, and what makes Karachi tick. And in this powerful debut, Samira Shackle explores the city of her mother's birth in the company of a handful of Kar Karachiites who show her a side of the city that Western journalists rarely see. 
Among them is Safdar, the ambulance driver, who knows the city's streets and shortcuts intimately and will stop at nothing to help his fellow citizens. There is Parveen, the activist, whose outspoken views on injustice repeatedly lead her towards danger. Zill is a hardened journalist whose commitment to getting the best scoops puts him at increasing risk, while Siraj, a map maker, angers the powerful as he attempts to record unrecognized areas. Um, as their individual experiences unfold and converge, Shackle tells the bigger story of Karachi over the past decade as it has endured a terrifying crime wave, a period in which the Taliban arrive in Pakistan, adding to the daily perils for its residents and pushing the city into the international spotlight. Uh, writing with intimate local knowledge and a global perspective, Shackle paints a vivid portrait of one of the most complex and compelling cities in the world, a city where the borders blur between politicians and gangsters and between lawful and unlawful, as dangerous new forces of violent extremism are pitted against old networks of power. So this is a great work of like current nonfiction. Um, again, I love reading about different cities around the world and what they deal with on a daily basis. Uh, so this is going to be a really gripping read. All right, and another fascinating book I got from it, which is out now, and you can you can pick up. It's from Melville House Publishing as well. And this is Gold, Oil, and Avocados, A Recent History of Latin America in 16 Commodities by Andy Robinson. Fascinating stuff. I keep getting text messages. Okay, it says here, the 21st century began optimistically in Latin America. Left-leaning leaders armed with programs to reduce poverty and reclaim national wealth were seeing results. But as the aughts gave way to the teens, they began to fall like dominoes. Where did the dreams of this pink tide go? Look no further than the original culprits of Latin American disenfranchisement. Resource-rich resource, resource land and unscrupulous extraction. Recounting the story commodity Recounting the story commodity by commodity, Andy Robinson reveals what oxen have to do with the rise of uh, Jair Bolsonaro, and that's uh, president, I believe, of Argentina or Bolivia or Argentina or another country. Bolsonaro. I know I should know this. Uh, how Quinoa explains the mob that descended on Evo Morales. And why oil, why is my camera glitching? Sorry. And why oil is behind the protracted coup in Venezuela. What's more, as high tech and green technologies demand new resources, a new generation of raw materials like coltan for smartphones, lithium for electric cars, and niobium for SpaceX rockets have become important players in the fate of Latin America. Um, in Gold, Oil, and Avocados, Robinson takes readers from the salt plains of Chile to the depths of the Amazonian jungle to stitch together the story of Latin America's last decade, showing how the imperial plunder of the past carries on today under a new name. So that is fabulous. I, again, I love reading works like this. Um, it just it kind of feeds into my, my interest in um, economy, trade, you know, um, natural resources and uh you know it kind of reminds me of like jared diamonds what guns germs and steel and stuff like that um but anyway gold oil and avocados by andy robinson this is available now and let me you know i'm gonna do a couple more hang on okay these Caliber books, yes. Uh, I had a publicist from Caliber Books uh, contact me about two new uh, paperbacks that are um, they're out. They're special value priced books that you can find, and one of them is is uh, only sold at Walmart. But um, they're history works, and if you shop at Walmart, I thought maybe you want to keep your eye out for this one. Um, it's a new series called like American War Heroes, and it's put up by Caliber Books. But this is called Battle Stations, How the USS Yorktown Helped Turn the Tide at Coral Sea and Midway by Stephen L. Moore. As you can see, this is only at Walmart. Um, but nice little paperback. If you're interested, keep an eye out for it. Uh, it says here, um, the true story of the valiant men who gave their all to save the aircraft carrier USS Yorktown and changed the course of the Pacific War. Um, let's see here. It says, on June 4th, 1942, six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Yorktown's crew began the carrier's final battle against Japan's infamous aircraft. 
Hotshot fighter pilot Lieutenant Scott McCuskey attacked from the air in his Wildcat, becoming the Navy's second ever ace in a day. Carpenter Boyd McKenzie worked tirelessly to repair Yorktown before a fresh airstrike. Critically injured gun crew member George Wise fought for his life as the ship threatened to capsize. Meanwhile, pharmacist mate second class Warren Heller raced to save the lives of bloodied gunners and sailors by evacuating them before time ran out. The story of these heroes and many other brave servicemen uh, bring to life the gripping narrative of Yorktown's final 30 days as she fights in the near back-to-back battles of Coral Sea and Midway. Through unpublished memoirs and interviews with Yorktown's last surviving veterans, acclaimed author Stephen L. Moore offers up a new and compelling account of a pivotal month in World War II while honoring the courage of those who served. All right. Looks like Stephen L. Moore and our, our author. He's written uh, 20 books or so on World War II and Texas history, it says. So uh, take a look. Um, I think this is uh, about $12.99. The list price, it'll probably be cheaper off the rack at Walmart. But check out that um, Battle Stations by Stephen L. Moore, American War Hero series from Caliber. And the other book that Caliber sent to me is about the true story of World War II American Red Cross volunteer Andrew Hodges, who traveled behind enemy lines to negotiate the release of 149 Allied prisoners of war. And that is told in this book, Behind Nazi Lines, My Father's Heroic Quest to Save 149 World War II POWs uh, by Andrew Garrow Howages Jr. and Denise George. Uh, looks like it's got a blurb from Eric McTaxis on the front, but also put out by Caliber. Um, this is only $12 uh, soft cover. It says here, in 1944, hundreds of Allied soldiers were trapped in POW camps in occupied France. The odds of their survival were long, the odds of escaping even longer, but one man had the courage to fight the odds. An elite British SAS operative on an, an assassination mission gone wrong. A Jewish New Yorker injured in a Nazi ambush. An 18-year-old Gary Cooper lookalike from Mobile, Alabama. These men and hundreds of other soldiers found themselves in the prisoner of war camps off the Atlantic coast of occupied France, fighting brutal conditions and unsympathetic captors. But miraculously, local villagers were able to smuggle out a message from the camp, one that reached the Allies and sparked a remarkable quest by an unlikely and truly inspiring hero. Andy Hodges had been excluded from military service due to a lingering shoulder injury from his college football days. Devastated but determined, Andy refused to sit at home while his fellow Americans risked their lives, so he joined the Red Cross, volunteering for the toughest assignments on the most dangerous battlefields. In the fall of 1944, Andy was tapped for what sounded like a suicide mission a desperate attempt to aid the Allied POWs in occupied France, alone and unarmed, matching his wits against the Nazi war machine. But despite the likelihood of failure, Andy did far more than deliver much-needed supplies. By the end of the year, he had negotiated the release of an unprecedented 149 prisoners, leaving no one behind. This is a true story of one man's selflessness, ingenuity, and victory in the face of impossible adversity. So doesn't that sound great? Doesn't that sound just rousing? And there is, yes, that indeed is and Andy Hodges. Um, fabulous. Yeah, pictures all in the insert and in the inset there. Um, so two great World War II books from Caliber that are very affordable. So take a look at those. Um, all right, I'm going to save these others got three more but they're I think they're fiction and one is a mystery one is a mystery it's wrapped in a very interesting package I'll save that for next time because we are at 44 minutes or so um but let me know what you think of these new arrivals um I hope you enjoy um there's a lot here to choose from uh so you know take notes uh, look for those that are coming up and the ones that are available now you know request at your library uh, if you can't afford a new copy, um, you know, there's always a way. And let me know if anyone out there is interested in, in the uh, the advanced review copy of the War. Uh, what was it again? A War of Empires by Robert Lyman. Okay. Um, in the meantime, guys, I will leave it there and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. And thanks for tuning in and subscribing as always. All right. Bye.